Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for attending this event, um, co-hosted by the Missile Defense Caucus and uh, Hudson Institute. I am a fellow at Hudson Institute. I handle the non-proliferation portfolios so that covers missile defense and um, nuclear deterrence. Uh, Hudson Institute was founded in 1961 by a strategist Herman Kahn, and Hudson Institute challenges conventional thinking and helps policymakers think through some of the toughest problems and offers solutions in the areas of defense and international relations, economics, healthcare, technology, culture, and law. Um, and it is a pleasure that uh, you all came to join us today to hear from um, uh, two of the most uh, dedicated members of Congress I know to this subject. Um, and then, of course, uh, to hear from General Mann as well. First, I'd like to introduce um, our, uh, the two uh, co-chairs of the Bipartisan Missile Defense Caucus, um, two members who I think are here in Congress for all of the right reasons. And um, I had the pleasure of working for one of them for several years. First is Congressman um, Doug Lamborn. He represents the 5th District of Colorado. And he's on the Armed Services Committee, as well as Congressman Trent Franks, representing the 8th District of Arizona, also on the House Armed Services Committee. Um, again, I, I, don't, I don't know of any, um, uh, any other members um, who are more dedicated to this um, particular subject. And I'll give uh, one little anecdote. I know that you know, Congressman Lamborn, Congressman Franks, anytime um, there is an event on missile defense, uh, both of them are there. Both of them are completely engaged in the subject and know more about the subject than anybody else on the Hill. I can give one little story about Congressman Franks just to demonstrate what a commitment he has to uh, the mission of missile defense. When I was working in his office as the military legislative assistant, this was back when, if you remember, uh, the, the rogue satellite was beginning to sort of careen towards Earth. And we were working late and working on this issue, and um, um, MDA was coordinating with STRATCOM. Everybody was trying to figure out how we were going to knock this thing out of the sky. And Congressman Franks came to me and he said, now, Rebecca, we need two press releases. The first press release uh, will, we will issue if we miss it. And it's going to say this is a technology that we need and, and the, 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 uh, the technology is so important and the mission is so important that we need to have more money. And it's because you know, we continue to cut funding that, that you know, the system needs more money. And the second press release we're going to issue is if we hit it. And that's going to say you know, the technology is so important. This just proves it's a proven technology and that it's so important. And, um, and he was completely serious and we were ready to go. And, and thankfully in Operation Burnt Frost we did hit that satellite, um, proving that the techno technology does work even in an operational setting. Um, and with that, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn from um, Colorado. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for all the years that you have devoted to our national defense and to this particular issue. And a big thanks also to the Hudson Institute for sponsoring this event. Uh, Trent and I, I'll introduce him in just a second here. Uh, we may have to leave it a little on the early side because of votes being called over on the, uh, in the, on the floor. Well, good afternoon. It's great to see such a strong turnout on this important issue. Uh, it's so important to get our nation's ballistic missile defense right. That's what this caucus is all about. That's what the general's work serving our country is all about. Our role here in Congress is especially to make hard budget decisions. So I have to say this right up front. Yesterday's uh, budget release saw the administration propose a missile defense budget that is $800 million below last year's budget. Now that's a remarkable message to send to our enemies in light of recent developments, especially in Iran and North Korea. Uh, let me, just out of the newspaper in the last few weeks, uh, you may remember this. Last Sunday, North Korea successfully launched a long-range missile. According to open source reports, this missile went 30% higher than their last missile and carried twice the payload. So if you do the math, North Korea now has the ability to hit most of the continental U.S. And this is a big deal given they have claimed to have set off a hydrogen bomb. Um, meanwhile, Iran will get international sanctions on its ballistic missiles thanks to uh, the, the, the sanctions relaxed thanks to the nuclear deal. So they're going to get about $100 billion in sanctions relief. Apparently, their recent UN violations aren't enough, and uh, they're now preparing to test their Simorg space vehicle, which would be their most capable rocket yet. And remember, the exact same technology that can be used for 
peaceful space launch purposes can easily be uh, used to launch a nuclear weapon. And I haven't even mentioned Russia and China. So I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the need for a strong national defense, miss, missile defense is greater than ever. The Missile Defense Caucus exists to educate members and staff on these very issues. In addition to having the great honor of hosting General Mann today, who spends a lot of time in my district in Colorado Springs, the caucus has other great events scheduled throughout the year, so be watching for those. Hope to see you in the future. With that, I'll turn things over to my good friend, Congressman Trent Franks of Arizona. Trent and I served together, not just on the Armed Services Committee, but on the Strategic Forces Subcommittee. Trent, I'm always impressed for your courage to stand up and fight for principles. It's been great to work with you on so many issues, especially given your leadership on missile defense. Over to you, Trent. Well, thank you, Congressman Lanborn. You know, Doug is a, is a very good friend, and I never have to worry about where this guy is. He's always been committed, always does his homework, always knows his stuff, and I, I'm just grateful to him, grateful to all of you for being here. Uh, I think you're that invisible front line of freedom. Uh, I say that to the groups out there that sort of come from the outside and, and try to uh, coordinate with what we try to do in, in on the inside. And I'm so just extremely grateful to all of you because, um, in the final analysis, this is about protecting our homeland, it's pro about protecting our families, our, our children, and the future. It's not to just the cool stuff uh, that happens in space. So I'm very thankful. I, I also wanted to say a special word of thanks uh, uh, to, um, let's see, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna introduce you just here in a moment, to General, but I wanna say a special word of thanks if I can to, Re to Rebecca Heinrichs. She served in our office, and I'll, I have to say to you, I don't think I would be standing here as chairman uh, of the Missile Defense Caucus without Rebecca's leadership. She's just a go-getter, and I'm grateful that she's working with the Hudson Institute, and I appreciate their efforts and what they're doing. It's, it's wonderful, um, and again, that outside help is so important. And uh, uh, ironically, uh, Andy Braun, who is our new MLA, uh, came at the uh, behest of Rebecca's recommendations. So she's really having a big uh, footprint on this whole situation here. And I understand that in an environment that we're in today, that there's a lot of political discussions, a lot of rhetoric that sometimes gets pretty hot. But fundamentally, uh, we are facing a circumstance in an environment of Iran and North Korea where we should see an advancing budget on missile defense, and yet we see tremendous pressure to reduce that. And that is out of sync with reality. And I'll probably just leave it right there but it bodes uh, profound implications for the decisions that we make this November. Uh, they're beyond any political considerations. These are very, very important decisions that we're gonna make, and I hope we do the right thing. Uh, missile defense uh, is you know, something that I suppose I've been playing with and studying since I was just a, a very young man. I, think I introduced my first uh, resolution on missile defense in the state legislature when I was 27 years old. Now, you, you do your own math. That's, that's more than a dozen years ago. Um, but uh, but the, the, rec the, the significance of it is hard to understate. And men and women in uniform, like the gentleman that we're going to be hearing from here in a moment, uh, that maintain their vigil, standing between the barbarians at the gates and, and our families, uh, there is no way to express uh, my own appreciation and, and honor for these men and women. People like me talk about freedom. They are the ones that carry the burden to make it real, to keep it intact. And uh, uh, Lieutenant General David Mann, uh, commander of U.S. Uh, Space, uh, Army Space and Missile Defense Command and Army uh, Forces Strategic Command, is among us today. And I'm going to try to read just a couple things about his CV because it's so impressive. I have to read them because I'll get tangled up with all these uh, uh, different nomenclature. General Mann has, has a, a number of diverse responsibilities. He, uh, in support of the Army, he is the commander of the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. That sounds pretty cool to me, uh, where he has Title X responsibilities to train, maintain, and equip space and global ballistic missile defense forces for the Army. Uh, and for the Army Forces Strategic Command, he is the Army Service Component Command uh, to, strategic, to, to STRATCOM, to Strategic Command. Uh, responsible for planning, integrating, and coordinating all Army forces and capabilities in support of STRATCOM's missions. 
General Mann is also the commander for STRATCOM's Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense, where he is responsible for synchronizing missile defense planning, conducting support for ballistic missile defense operations, and advocating for missile defense capabilities on behalf of the warfighter and the combatant commanders. That's a big, that's a, that's a big responsibility. On behalf of my seven-year-olds, thank you, and I hope you do a really good job. We, ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General David Mann. Oh, this is great. I tell you what, to have you all here uh, does my heart good. I have to tell you, uh, uh, shamelessly, I, I, this is a, a subject that is near and dear to my, my heart. You know, I'm a, uh, an air defender, uh, 35 years of service now. I uh, came into the military, quite frankly, I was sharing with uh, some folks earlier on. I grew up in the Air Force, and, and I wanted to fly like my dad, but I didn't have the eyes. So out of spite, I joined the Army where we shoot down airplanes. And, uh, but, but anyway, I became uh, very, very passionate uh, about this, uh, this field. And, and Congressman Frank, thank, thank you very, very much uh, for your, your kind introduction. And to both of you, uh, we just want to say thanks for what you do on behalf of the men and women and our families uh, that, that serve in the armed forces, all the services. So God bless you. Thank you very much for what you do day in and day out. Uh, I also want to say thanks to, to Rebecca. You know, she heard me speak a couple, a couple months ago, and uh, surprisingly to me, she asked me to come back and speak again. I, you know, she must have fallen asleep halfway through my, my presentation because she still asked me to come back and speak. Um, but uh, as Congressman Franks mentioned, uh, you know, we're a couple different hats like, uh, like a lot of general officers do, quite frankly. And what I like to do is just to, to kind of save time talking about that command, because I really want to get to the issue at hand and to really get to any questions that you may have. I'd like to show you, again, I'm very shameless. I like to brag about those great folks that are on my team, but I'd like to show you a very, very short clip about the men and women who are serving in your army uh, protecting us against uh, ballistic missile threats. So please.
Okay. Hey, really, I did that because I know that everyone had, to, had a big lunch, so just to kind of wake folks up a little bit. But, but again, I'm going to go through uh, some comments uh, fairly quickly because I really want to make sure that I save time for any uh, questions that you may have. Um, uh, you know, as the Congressman stated, it's been a very, very busy year uh, for the missile defense community. And, and I think we have to also be very, very mindful of the nature of the threat uh, that, that's out there. Um, I think it's fair to say that we feel very, very confident in our Navy, in our Air Force, in, in our Army, our tank formations, our infantry formations. I don't think there's too many threats out there that we're really too concerned about in terms of force-on-force -force operations. But the threat out there acknowledges that. And so as a result, they're looking at any kind of, uh, of vulnerabilities that we may have. And quite frankly, if you think about it, uh, if you're a threat nation uh, and, and you want to, uh, uh, to go against our strengths, uh, you're going to be kind of uh, uh, reluctant to do that. You're going to look at, uh, at other cost-effective ways of getting after potential vulnerabilities. And so that's the reason why you're hearing so much about cyber. You're hearing about ballistic missiles. Uh, you're hearing about a lot of other things that are out there that really don't go to the traditional force-on-force uh, -force operations that uh, many of us are very, very familiar with. If you think about it, uh, from a threat perspective, it's a lot more cost-effective to leverage missile technologies that's out there on the, uh, uh, on the open net uh, rather than have to buy aircraft, train crews, maintain proficiency, maintenance, and all the other things. And so again, the nature of the threat is such that our, our potential adversaries are looking at potential gaps or vulnerabilities that we may have. And that's the reason why it is so important that we make the necessary investment in those areas uh, that they're, that they're uh, really uh, putting their investments into. We, we know that the nature of the threat is becoming more complex, more unpredictable. Uh, they're more mobile, they're more survivable. Um, and also the proliferation of technology, whether it's ballistic missiles or cruise missiles, is extremely disturbing. Uh, we only have to look at uh, the nuclear uh, uh, interest of some of our potential adversaries, North Korea, Iran, uh, as, as uh, a, uh, uh, for, for food for, for pause, really, for, for thought. We, we really need to focus our efforts a little bit more succinctly against those threats that uh, that the uh, enemy, is, enemy is trying to uh, exploit. Uh, the recent space launch from North Korea, uh, you know, that satellite is in orbit. I don't think it's transmitting as we speak, but it does reflect a capability that North Korea is trying to leverage in terms of ballistic missile technologies. That's disconcerting it's, and uh, we got to get after it is the bottom line. I, I think quite frankly, uh, holistically, our, our approach is right on track. What we're doing right now is we're looking more than just the typical, let's buy X number of interceptors, whether it's SM3s or THAAD or whatever, but to look more holistically at non-kinetic applications. So the days of just iron on iron, so to speak, uh, options, uh, we, we need to, it's not a panacea, but we need to kind of advance or uh, raise the level of sophistication in our thinking in terms of how do we address the nature of the threat that's out there. We also need to take a look at uh, more than just the terminal phase of flight. We know that ballistic missiles, they have the boost phase, they have the mid-course, and they have the terminal phase. And if you look at a lot of our programs, quite frankly, they're kind of focused on the terminal phase. They're focused with the SM3s and THAAD and Patriot. Uh, our GBIs, our ground-based interceptors, they're looking at that mid-course uh, layer. But we need to look more holistically, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, obviously. Uh, it's going to require resources, and uh, I'm not so naive as, as to no, not uh, to recognize the fact that we have a lot of different priorities that we have out there. Um, we saw the budget recently came out for 17. That said, though, I, I want to take this uh, opportunity to thank both of you uh, for, for FY16, because quite frankly, if you look at FY16, uh, our Patriot product improvement uh, program is better funded than it has been in years gone by. So I'm just kind of counting on or hoping that looking into 17, uh, some modifications or adjustments may be made to help those accounts uh, come up a little bit in terms of their funding. Um, also, uh, I want to thank you both for FY16 and as far as MDA's budget. I'm saying this on behalf of Vice Admiral Jim Searing because you know, there was a little bit of a plus up in MDA's account. And that 
uh, those investments are so critically important in, important in terms of R&D. And, uh, and I know Jim is very, very thankful for what you've been able to do in terms of increasing those accounts. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about the ground-based interceptor. Uh, and you saw some pictures of that in, in the film. That capability resides up in Fort Greeley, Alaska, and also at Vandenberg Air Force Base in Cal uh, California. What you have to understand is that is the nation's only defense, the only defense that we have against a limited intercontinental ballistic missile attack, whether it's coming out of Iran or North Korea. That is it. That capability, quite frankly, is manned by National Guardsmen on active duty, 24-7, 365. They're very good at what they do. Uh, they're very confident in what they do. And they also take the mission very, very seriously. And so I just say, uh, when, when you hit your knees tonight, please make sure you say um, a special thanks to those men and women that are up there in Fort Greeley. I don't know if it's 40 degrees below right now, but uh, they probably only get a couple hours of daylight anyway. And, and they do so, uh, they, they have a kind of a motto, the 300 protecting the 300 million plus. And, and it's aptly, uh, you know, it's, it's very, very appropriate, quite frankly. Uh, looking at that capability out there, I want to thank Congress for helping us make some improvements. Uh, right now we have 30 uh, missiles in, in silos that provide that defense. We're growing that capability to 44. We're adding a third missile field up at Fort Greeley. That should be operational by the end of FY17, and that will increase uh, the, the size of our quiver and the number of interceptors that we have. We're also doing some work in terms of command and control operations, the software that we use to make sure that we stay ahead of any kind of a cyber threat vulnerability, and also to make sure that the weapon system is as effective as it can possibly be. We're also putting an in-flight uh, station uh, at Fort Drum. That will allow us to have more updates to the missile while it's in flight and to also increase the, uh, the effectiveness of our interceptors uh, taking out any kind of perceived threats coming in uh, against the United States. Uh, we're also working very, very closely with the Missile Defense Agency on the exo-atmospheric kill vehicle. Um, you know, if you think about it, you're hitting a missile with a missile at closing speeds that uh, are at extreme Mach levels. It's just unbelievable. And any of you have, that have been able to see some of the clips that have come out where it shows an interceptor going against a threat vehicle coming in and seeing how quickly that, that uh, uh, engagement takes place, it's just, it truly is rocket science, uh, to be quite frank. But we're, uh, we recently had a very, very successful test, my hat's off to MDA, where we were able to uh, further the confidence of the warfighter in our GBI fleet. Uh, it was a capability uh, enhancement two variant of the, uh, of the GBI. It took off and it was able to, uh, to um, exploit some alternate uh, threat, divert threat, uh, thrusters that we have on board that, uh, that platform uh, to further increase the effectiveness uh, of, that, uh, of that GBI. It also has increased discrimination capabilities to be able to pick out the threat vehicle in that threat complex. As we all know, when ballistic missiles uh, go up into the atmosphere and they're about to come back down, a lot of times they deploy decoys and a lot of debris. And being able to find the right threat set uh, is, is, uh, is a very challenging proposition. Uh, the CE2 uh, has added uh, capabilities against more challenging threat sets that we see out there. So again, hats off to MDA on that recent uh, uh, successful uh, test that took place. Um, and we're also looking at uh, in terms of the Army side of the house, how can we take our lower tier systems and make them more, more capable? Uh, historically, when we had to, to deploy an Army system, we had to send the whole battalion. I'm talking about the Patriot weapon system, which is a great weapon system. But in the past, when we deployed it, we had to take the whole battalion and move it. Well, I don't have to tell you, we only have 15 of those battalions. So it really limits your flexibility. <clears throat> so what we've developed is a way of networking the components of the battalion so you can take pieces of the battalion, move it to wherever you need to move it to, leverage other sensors that are out there, whether it's spy radars off the Aegis ships or, or other terrestrial sensors that are out there, to be able to prosecute a threat engagement. Uh, we've had a couple of successful tests with that uh, where we were able to fire a Patriot missile 
using a Sentinel radar, not the organic Patriot uh, radar, and it was very, very successful. So we're really uh, making some huge inroads in terms of exploiting the capabilities of the Patriot system, which will be with us for many, many years to come. So I really just would like to stress to, uh, to Congress that we really need to continue uh, to modernize the fleet, whether it's upgrades to the radar or uh, more capable variants of the interceptor. And I, again, I really thank, thank you both for, uh, for the plus up that we got for this year, uh, but obviously FY17, we're a little concerned about that. Um, we also, quite frankly, need to do a better job of working with our allies, okay? It, you know, we talk about this all the time. And, and quite frankly, in the Defense Department, you, you know, we say that we need to leverage our allies and coalition partners. Well, we, we quite frankly need to do a better job of that. There's some policy concerns, foreign disclosure concerns, uh, and whatnot, but that's something that OSD policy, in fact, is really looking at. How can we take our coalition partners' capabilities and really truly integrate it into the BMDS, the Ballistic Missile Defense Architecture? How can we really network in their systems? There's a lot of FMS cases out there right now. We have a lot of capabilities out there, and we have to work, and this, I'm kind of talking to myself, I'm looking in the mirror when I say this, we have to do a better job of truly integrating their capabilities uh, into this problem set. Um, I will tell you that we're already making some, some great inroads. Recently had a, a tier level one nimble titan exercise, that's where we bring uh, nations together to talk about missile defense. We had uh, members from the Republic of Korea that were there, sir. And we also had people, f uh, folks from Japan and from Australia and from Oman and Saudi Arabia and, and uh, United Arab Emirates, as well as our NATO partners. Around 23 countries were there. We do this every two years, and what it allows us to do is to really get after some of these vexing, uh, challenging policy-related issues and really get after uh, how we can partner better and really leverage each other's uh, capabilities to get after this problem, set, which is not diminishing. Ballistic missiles are, in the in are on the increase, as well as their capabilities and uh, the danger associated with them. So a great exercise that we continue to execute. It's laborious, it takes time, but we're, we're working our way through a lot of these policy issues to get after that. Um, we're also making some advances with Aegis Ashore, I think you all know about in Europe. Uh, we're putting a site in Roma Romania that will be operational by this summer, and then we're going to put another site in Poland uh, by the end of 18, FY18. That capability is focused on threats emanating from the Middle East, uh, but it utilizes the SM3 missile, very capable system, and uh, again, we're really making some, some huge progress. Another shout out to Missile Defense Agency for all the hard work uh, that, uh, that they have put into that program. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about technology. You saw on here directed energy. Uh, that's one of those non-kinetic applications that I'm, you know, we're, we're really trying to exploit. Jim Searing is looking at directed energy from a high level, uh, long loiter time platform where we can focus directed energy against the boost phase of flight. I'm looking at more at the lower tier level uh, where we're looking at cruise, or cruise missiles, UAVs, rockets, artillery, and mortars. And we've already had some successes on the lower tier side of the house Basically, the technology is pretty much the same, but how you apply it, beam control, power output, proximity to the target, all those come into play. But uh, a lot of great work is being done in that area, and also, it's very, very cost uh, uh, effective. It really helps us exploit our systems. And it's just, it's not a panacea, it's a, it's a complement to the other options that we have out there. So, um, I know that the congressmen are gonna have to leave here in just a second here, but I want to go ahead and, and uh, finish my remarks right now to make sure that I get after any comments that you may have or questions that you may have related to missile defense. Thank you, though. And please say a prayer for those folks that are manning those sites up in Fort Greeley, Alaska, and Vandenberg. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for coming. Thank you. Okay. Mind, sir? Please. I think what I'd like to do now, and if, you know, just a reminder: when the congressmen have to leave, it's you know they're not offended by anything that was said. They just have to um, 
get to the get to the floor to vote, uh, which is why they're here. So we appreciate the remarks. Um, once again, thank you all three of you for coming. Um, you're, you've got a very busy schedule, so this just shows your commitment to the to the mission, and so we appreciate that. And thank you, General. What I'd like to do is just um, ask a couple of questions based on his remarks myself, and then open it um, uh, in a few minutes to those who might have questions, and then at that point you can just stand right there at the microphone and identify yourself and go ahead and ask your question. My first question, um, you touched on a little bit in terms of cooperating with allies, um, and then um, and also sort of leveraging the current capabilities we have now to, to get the most out of them. Um, given the recent North Korea launch, it sort of has turned the world's attention again to North Korea's ballistic missile program. What, what can, can you tell us uh, the operational, um, why it would be operationally helpful, to, useful to the United States and to South Korea to deploy the THAAD weapon system? Mm -hmm. And um, without speaking to um, whether or not the United States is going to do that, I know that's at the very highest level and just beginning on talks on that, I think, officially here recently. What, what that gives the operator, what that gives the United States and also our allies in South Korea? Um, I think uh, it kind of goes back to some of my earlier points. I think we have to be very, very careful about having uh, uh, kind of a one system approach. It really is a layered approach that we have to get after. Um, you know, Patriot is a great capable system. Uh, but its limitations, its altitude ceilings only go up so far. But then we have THAAD, which takes us a, a little bit higher and also covers some, some um, classified vulnerabilities that we have. Uh, there's a gap uh, there. And so THAAD really helps us cover that gap as well as um, uh, even further up into, uh, into altitude. SM3, great program, has a lot of capability. Uh, but what THAAD does by adding it to, uh, to the peninsula is really significantly enhances our ballistic missile defense capabilities. Because if you think about it, right now what do we have there? We have Patriot battalions that are on peninsula, and they have a great, they're very, very capable. But some of your higher-end ballistic missiles, they would be challenged uh, against. So THAAD really allows us to, uh, uh, to provide that layered uh, capability that is very, very much needed uh, on Penn. Uh, so I don't know if that answers that, along with all these uh, improvements that we're making to the GBI fleet in Alaska and, and uh, in Vandenberg also are extremely important so that we have the full plethora of capabilities to address a very complex uh, target array. Great. Yeah, my next question is, um, again, um, part of your responsibility, always looking for ways to, to squeeze the most out of the capabilities that we have um, uh, because we're all, been, the entire Department of Defense is under pressure, yeah. um, budgetary pressure, um, but MDA and, um, and then the greater missile defense por portfolio um, has been um, especially under great pressure. Can, can you talk about, um, uh, you know, there's a tension between modernizing our current systems, making sure they can work better and that we're, we're more confident in their capabilities, and also just increasing numbers, increasing capacity. And that's you know goes to you know the 14 extra GBIs we're going to put put in um, uh, in Conus, um, but what about there's always talk about more GBIs than just those 14. Um, not can you talk about what that gives from an operational standpoint more interceptors, um, and, um, uh, and and how that's helpful. Uh, um, when you look at a threat, uh, you also look at the capability of your interceptor or interceptors to address that threat. And we call it probability of kill. And so in some cases, if you really want to achieve a, a high level of a prob probability of kill, in many cases you have to fire more than just one missile, one interceptor. So obviously, just to share math, having more interceptors uh, really helps you with your shot doctrine and with your ability to, uh, to really achieve those high probabilities of kill uh, that are out there. But um, but, but it's more than that. You know, it's more than just adding missiles uh, and putting missiles in the hole or in the ground out there. We have to really maximize the capability of the missiles, and that's the reason why myself and Admiral Searing have really been advocating uh, not only making improvements to the current fleet, but really looking at the discrimination. And many of you heard me, uh, heard Jim talk about the discrimination capabilities. Uh, because if you can be more accurate with your targeting, then you don't have to fire as many missiles. Okay, if you can really hit that, that threat vehicle that's coming in, uh, then you don't have to send X number of missiles up there. 
So being as efficient as possible with the current fleet is something that has to be taken into, into account. Third, uh, I think it's fair to say that you know, there is a uh, challenging budget environment that we're all operating in. And um, if you're asking me and if you're asking Jim Searing, what our best uh, military advice for the finite resources that are going to be given to the Department of Defense, the best bang for the buck, the best use of taxpayer money is to make sure that the current fleet is as capable as it can possibly be uh, and that we truly get after the discrimination challenge that's out there. Because it, what, what the threat is really focused on is making that threat complex as challenging, whether it's decoys or countermeasures, making it as challenging as possible. And so that's the reason why I think there's a balance. Yes, adding more missiles is good, but there's a balance to make sure that the missiles that you have, the missiles that you're adding, are fully uh, exploited to their full capability. Yeah, I think it's important, I mean, you touched on the threat piece too, and it's important for, um, for all of us to, to think about, and the current law states that the, that the United States is to deploy a, a missile defense system to uh, defend against the limited threat. Um, it's not to be just a limited threat, but that's a minimum, at least the limited threat, um, whether an intentional accidental launch, mm -hmm. or unintended launch, um, or deliberate launch. And, but we've seen the threat, what, what was once limited even just a couple of years ago, considered a limited threat, uh, is actually becoming more sophisticated in terms of countermeasures, in terms of the ability to launch more salvos. And then the other piece is the cruise missile threat right. is presenting its own particular challenge. Um, and can you talk to us a little bit about the, the challenge of the cruise missile threat and where that's coming from and, and the sort of technologies that might help us to best defend against that particular threat? Well, obviously, Russia, China, uh, they're looking at uh, cruise missile technologies, have been for, for years. Uh, you know, China in, in, in particular is looking at NA ship uh, type missile systems that, uh, that, you know, obviously the Navy is very, very concerned about. Um, and, and we as a department, we uh, and Missile Defense Agency is also looking very, very heavily at, at cruise missiles, how we address that. I think many of you have already seen some, some recent tests with the SM-6 missile and SM-3 variants that really helps us uh, address some of the cruise missiles, but it's just not one program. You know, on the Army side of the house, you know, we're looking, I talked about directed energy, but we're looking at uh, our indirect fire capability that will allow us to have like a, a multi-mission launcher, basically a launcher that has different types of missiles in it, some that can go after UAVs, some that can go after cruise missiles, and also adding to that complement directed energy that is very, very cost informed in terms of how we can really uh, uh, get after that threat set. So, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of times I think members of Congress may be concerned that doggone, there's a lot of redundancy uh, that you see across the department, and maybe there is in certain cases. But in this area, I, I think you you have to look at the threat sets, you have to look at the environment, and you have to look at how you employ the system. And uh, obviously, SM3s are good, but if you're in the middle of Afghanistan, guess what? You're probably going to be a little challenged to use an SM6 or, or whatever to take care of a cruise missile. So we have to have the capability that will protect a warfighter uh, regardless of what domain they're operating in. And that's the reason why I work very closely with Missile Defense Agency. I work very, very closely with the Navy on some of their directed energy uh, technologies, ship defense that they're going after, where I can learn or leverage some of their lessons learned, and I share the same with them. So there's a lot of collaboration that does take place between the services, more so uh, than you would think. And quite frankly, uh, I, I'm a little biased in this regard, but I would say in the area of missile defense, really space and missile defense, uh, we probably lead, uh, I think, the department in terms of collaboration across the services. And, and that, that, that's, a good, that's a good story, quite frankly. I'd like to open it to the floor if there's a couple of questions. Um, um, if the congressmen have first, I'd like to give the floor to them if they do have a, a question before they have to go vote. Um, sir, sure. Um, we have to continue to support EKV redesign, okay? 
and, and we're doing that with some upgrades to the current variant. But you know, we're looking at the uh, multi-object kill vehicle that will allow us to use one interceptor, but it has uh, the ability to, to address multiple threat sets. That's on the high end. On the low end, uh, I, I could not be more emphatic about the need we have to support the Patriot uh, product improvement, as well as uh, some of these other um, uh, in, indirect fire uh, capability that we're trying to use against the, against the cruise missile. Um, a lot of folks think, well, Patriot's been out there for so many years. You know, regardless if we come up with some great technology overnight, Patriot is going to be with us for many, many years. It's going to be like the B-52. It's going to be with us for many, many years. A lot of our partners around the world have purchased Patriot. And there's a lot more that we can get out of that system. And we can do so in a very cost-informed manner in terms of product improvement, whether it's upgrades to the radar, whether it's uh, the MSC missile, as you all are, have uh, so graciously supported. I, I would just say those, those are the two areas. Uh, sir, if you could take the microphone, if you have a question. Please. Sir, I, I don't know if you have to leave for a vote or not, but if, did you have any question? Well, I, I think it's first uh, important that we take a step back and take a look at the system that we have today, what it was it designed to, to really uh, uh, protect us against. Threats emanating from North Korea and Iran. Are they making improvements? Yes. But when you talk about uh, near-peer competitors, Russia and China, the system was never developed uh, to go against those kind of threats, to be quite honest with you, sir. And so you're, you're, your point is, is, is right on, on target. But I think that, um, I think that the, the improvements that we're making to the EKV right now in terms of discrimination uh, improvements, uh, alternate uh, divert thruster uh, technologies that were, that will help us a little bit. That's the reason why I mentioned about the, uh, the multi-object kill vehicle. That's some of the leap ahead technologies that we're trying to get after that will give us the capability to stay ahead of the threat. I feel, as I sit here today, I feel very confident in our capability to address threats coming out of North Korea and Iran. But I say that uh, with very, very cautious optimism in terms of the advancements that they're making. And so that's the reason why support for some of these uh, programs is so critically important so that we can stay ahead of the threat. Regarding whether or not we want to develop systems that will address near-peer competitors, that quite frankly is a policy issue. That's something that we would have to really uh, make a, uh, a decision whether or not we want to develop a capability. The, the multi-object kill vehicle will give us great capability, but the threat, near-peer th threats aren't standing still. And so their systems are a heck of a lot more uh, sophisticated and more challenging. Uh, but again, that system was always designed against near, uh, not near-peer, but uh, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I, I mean, uh, Congressman, I, um, I think the recent tests that we have seen with uh, the CE2 fleet, uh, some of the uh, things that we're seeing with the multi-object, I mean, we're talking rocket science, so this is not easy stuff. Um, but I am very heartened by the fact that with that, putting long-range discrimination radars to give us better track fidelity data, um, I think it's a very, very wise investment. 
Not, not only that, sir, but I also think uh, the investments that we're making looking into the future will help us stay ahead of North Korea and Iran. Uh, again, that's a separate t t topic if we're talking about uh, Russia and China. And, and, that, and I think you have a valid point there. But uh, I, I think the nature of that mission for that system is, is limited in C ICBM capability. And right now as we, s we stand here today and what we're doing in terms of our technology development, I feel very, very confident if we continue to receive the support for those programs that we'll be able to stay ahead of the threat there. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. We have a, there was a question in the back from the gentleman. Yeah. Well, um, my name is Warren Madison. Uh, considering uh, the problem and discrimination of incoming decoys and so forth, I noticed that there was an area that you never even mentioned in all of this and what might be involved in taking a closer look at it. And that has to do with space-based interceptor systems, which might get around, I don't know, but might get around the problem of that discrimination and maybe picking out the wrong one, but trying to pick up an incoming as it is starting the terminal phase, which I think it can only do with space-based interceptors. And whether the Congress is looking at that I imagine more funding is necessary, more research, but it seems to me that's a better way when you're dealing with the threat of missiles from North Korea and Iran and the time period, you're talking about a year or two now, I think that thinks that, that's not, you know, I think there's a problem there. But space-based technology, as far as I know, is somewhat available, but, but you never mentioned it. Okay, well, I got to make sure that I don't get ahead of myself because, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, Admiral Searing and, and MDA have a number of programs. Again, finite resources. You're trying to get the biggest bang for your buck and um, being good stewards of taxpayer monies there. And uh, thank you, Congressman. Uh, but I, I, I have heard Jim Searing talk about uh, the, the fact that we are looking at on orbit applications, on orbit platforms. Uh, that we can, I mean, it's, it's in kind of the nascent phase, but we are looking at on-orbit capabilities uh, to get after uh, that or to provide better track fidelity. But, but again, it's more than just iron on iron. We also are looking at some non-kinetic solutions that will help allow us to uh, be more cost-effective with this problem set. Sure, you want to come up and grab the microphone there? And I, I just add on to that too. I know for years, um, even the previous administration has has actually put funding for reports towards that end, um, but it but it's been having trouble getting funded because there is some um, it's, they have a hard time getting some bipartisan support for that. But um, but clearly the threat to our space assets, in addition to what's the, the vantage point that space would give us, would be great. But but our space assets are also at risk. So I appreciate that question as well, sir. Yes, uh, thank you, General. Uh, my name is David Brunstrom. I work for Reuters. Uh, I wanted to just uh, follow up on what you were saying about THAAD. Now that the formal uh, uh, talks uh, have been, uh, are going to start, I mean, how soon could we expect uh, a deployment of THAAD on the Korean Peninsula and perhaps in Japan? And how important is that? Sorry, uh, just to um, continue. Um, you mentioned the satellite is in orbit but doesn't appear to be transmitting. And in fact, that's been on some of the open sources right. they have talked about. They, they have not been able to really uh, verify that it's operating or transmitting. Right. But do you think it's in a, in a stable orbit? And uh, if it is, is that, does that represent any sort of progress uh, by the North Koreans that would uh, suggest the need for uh, additional defenses uh, on well, the I, You know, I think if you look at the previous launch, and the payload that they put on orbit with the set this, this uh, most recent launch, just the increase in weight uh, is, I think, um, uh, is an important factor. Uh, whenever you're able to put something into orbit, I think that's, uh, uh, that's significant, that kind of capability. And then also the, um, the collateral uh, 
uh, uses for that technology that obviously is very, very concerning to, to nations around the world in terms of ICBM uh, capabilities. So uh, I think the fact that the payload was, I think, almost twice as large as the previous payload as far as weight uh, is a concern. Uh, regarding THAAD uh, in, uh, uh, in the Republic of Korea, I think, in fact, it's in a lot of the open source media. Uh, discussions will start, I'm, I'm told discussions will start taking place. There's been no timeline whatsoever in terms of uh, the possible employment of THAAD on the peninsula. Uh, but uh, I think both governments uh, are going to begin discussions looking at the feasibility of that. And then we'll say, see what happens from there. Thank you. We have time for maybe one more, uh, one more question. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai. Uh, I have a couple questions. Uh, number one, what are we, I came in a little bit late. Uh, what are we doing to protect South Korea? And number two, is Japan capable of defending herself? So that's my question. Okay, well that, I mean, that's, could you give me a harder one? <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to speak for, uh, you know, for Japan in terms of its, its defense capabilities. Uh, I think you know that the United States and Japan are, are in partnership with the development of SM3 capabilities and whatnot. I think you also know that we've already uh, recently put a, a second Tipi Y2 missile uh, surveillance radar in Kyogo Masaki that recently uh, was, was placed there. So we're increasing the capabilities in terms of missile warning, missile surveillance. Uh, obviously, you know, there's an Aegis component, whether it's US or uh, Japanese Aegis capabilities. So, uh, you know, I'll leave it up to you to, uh, you know, to ask the government of Japan how they feel about their own defense capabilities. I just feel very, comfortable with the relationship that we've really established with uh, the government of Japan. In fact, Japan had some representatives that attended, like I said, this recent Nimble Titan exercise. And they were very, uh, they were great uh, members of that, uh, of that tabletop and really sh shared some, some very cogent, very profound thoughts. And I thought it was a very good, uh, uh, you know, uh, participation on their part in terms of that exercise. So we're very, we work very, very closely with, with Japan in a lot of different ways. Well, thank you so much. I think um, this was incredibly timely and very informative. Um, and I thank you all once again for attending this. And would you all join me in thanking General Mann? Thank you. Thank you.